no stranger to Wickham Skeptics in the pub, as he is. Oh, I don't, we don't really have members, but we'll, we'll call you a member. Um, a, a regular attendee of, of, of the group, sorry? Punter. A punter? Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I'll go with member. Um, so, uh, we saw Antonis last year, was it? You did a very short bit about black holes. Am I right? No. Dark, dark energy. Dark energy. Sorry, I dark didn't... matter. Dark matter. It was dark matter. Dark matter. It was very short, quarter an hour talk, and absolutely everybody after said, I could have heard more of that. So, we're not going to be talking about that specific topic, but we are in for a really good talk. So please give a round of applause, and I'm going to mess up both pronunciations of both bits of your name. Antonis Papanistas. That'll do. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. So I am a regular physicist. I'm, I'm not a public speaker as such. And I work at a place called Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. It's close to Ditcote. You can see the towers that don't exist anymore. <laughs> uh, the, the three last ones were demolished uh, this week. And, and this, is, this is for my work. My office is somewhere over there. We've got the diamond lice source there and some neutron sources and, and other things. But my actual research is happening in Geneva at, at CERN, at PLHC where I spend a significant amount of time, and now I kind of commute a little bit back and forth. Now, when I talk to the public, most of the time I talk to schools, and students have the advantage over you that they've done the physics lessons very, very recently, but, you know, they might just have taken the GCSE exams or A-level exams, and I suspect that you probably don't quite remember your physics <laughs> from high school. So I have to introduce a lot of possibly difficult concepts when it comes to particle physics. So I'll try to do it in, a, in an easy way, we'll give you a little bit of history so that you understand how we go to where we are. At the same time, maybe you shouldn't expect to understand completely everything. This is, not, this is not meant to be a lecture where I explain completely everything, but I'll try and give you an idea what it is that we do at CERN uh, and, and why we do it, why it's important. Um, I'm not going to use formulas in this talk, apart from these two, and just to remind you two concepts. One is momentum. I'm going to be talking a lot about momentum. And in classical mechanics, it's defined as the mass times the velocity. So an object that is moving fast has a lot of momentum, or an object that's heavy also has a lot of momentum. And if it's heavy and it's moving fast, then it has quite a lot of momentum. Uh, and then there's kinetic energy as well. Uh, and you see the difference here, the velocity is in squared. So there's a difference there. If you double the velocity, you double the momentum. And if you double the velocity, you quadruple the kinetic energy. What is important about both of these quantities is that they're conserved. And because of momentum conservation, you get a recoil from a cannon firing a, a bomb. Right? So the ball is going forward, and everything was stationary in the beginning, so the cannon has to move a little bit back. Ball is small, so it travels at high velocity. The, the current is big and heavy, so it only has to go a little bit back. And these, these concepts are quite important. The next concept that's really important is a magnetic field. Now, you all, I'm sure, have magnets on your fridges at home, right? And if I talk about a magnet, maybe you think of your school bar magnet, which is your, the typical example with a south and a north pole. And the, the lines of the magnetic field, the density of the lines, give us an idea of how strong the magnetic field is. And in your typical bar magnet, of course, the magnetic field is non-uniform, right? As you can see, it's very strong towards close to the poles. It gets weaker further away. But if we flatten the magnet a little bit and put two of them together, then we can make a north and the south pole very close together. And in this way, we can make a uniform magnetic field. And we use magnetic fields a lot in particle physics. And this is how we make them. Now, normal magnets are not strong enough to create strong magnetic fields. So what we do is we use electromagnets. We use coils. And this is an example from an accelerator, an early accelerator, where you've got the two coils here. And in the middle, you create a uniform magnetic field a little bit like that. Right, that's your basic um, sort of GCSE physics, if you like. Uh, I guess a little bit more. Now, the, the thing that's, that we also probably remember is that if you have a current, a current might create a magnetic field, 
And we know that because if you put a wire with a current and you put a compass next to it, the compass changes direction. This is because of the magnetic field that you create with a, with a current. And of course, this is how electric motors work, right? This is the principle of an electric motor. You go to a magnet and you pass through a current and that forces the, the motor to turn. What I want to say here is that the current is a flow of electricity, right? We've got electrons that are flowing through a wire. So if we take a single particle, like an electron, if it's moving and the particular particle is charged, it's like a current. It will behave in the same way. So if we then put it inside the magnetic field, it will actually change direction and will bend. So this is a good example. The magnetic field here is a uniform magnetic field like we saw before. The magnets are on top and below. It goes this way. So if a particle has no charge, it will just go straight. If it has a positive charge, it will bend one way. And if it has a negative charge, it will bend the other way. And how much it's going to bend, it will depend on how fast it's going. So if it's going fast, it will bend only a little bit because it has a lot of momentum. The force on it is, is always the same. While if it's going slowly, it will probably start curling and, and bending a little, and significantly more. This is the reason why the Earth's magnetic field is actually protecting us from radiation, from space radiation. What happens, you've got mostly the solar wind, it comes in, the particles come in, they find the magnetic field of the Earth, and then they start curling around because of the field this force, because of magne the magnetic field. So they end up going towards the poles most of the time. And this is how we get the aurora borealis and you know, the northern lights. This is the reason we get all of these solar storms, the particles come in, they go towards the north, and this is where you get the excitation of the, of the molecules of the air. Right, so let's take things back a little bit and see how we go to have something like the LHC and, and what it is that we're doing with it. It all started about 100 years ago or so with, uh, well, with actually a cathode ray uh, tubes. Uh, the first thing that they discovered were the cathode rays, which, were, which are electrons that if you warm up a cathode, a wire, they get emitted. And then what you've got is you've got a tube, you've got pretty much vacuum in here, or you can put a little, uh, a, a low, low density gas, like uh, neon, neon lights, right? This is exactly how they work. And then you get a current of electrons that get emitted from the, the anode and they hit the cathode. And there you get X-rays. So this is how they discovered the X-rays for the first time, and they had no idea what they were, and they called them X-rays, because they didn't know what it was. Now, today, we've got a cathode ray tube that's your old-style TV, right? You've got a little accelerator in here, you've got an electron em em emitter there, you accelerate the electrons, and then you actually hit the front of the screen, and that's how you make the image. The front of the screen then fluoresces, and this is how you create an image. And then, of course, Marie Curie and Pierre Curie, they discovered radioactivity uh, with all of the experiments that they were doing. So generally, people were finding things in front of them, if you like, and they didn't really know what was going on. They were doing all sorts of little experiments in to try and understand. And after a while, and after doing, you know, using the natural radioactivity, natural um, uh, elements, we came up to know of the three types of radioactivity. Alpha, beta, and gamma, usual Greek letters. Gamma are photons, no mass, uh, no, no charge. Alpha particles, they are positive, and they're a little bit heavy. Beta particles are electrons. And if we put a, a, a source that, that has these kinds of radioactivity, then electro if we put this in a magnetic field, the electrons bend one way, the particles, the alpha particles go the other way. In a bit, we'll realize that Actually, the fact that all the alpha particles do more or less the same trajectory, but the electrons do different trajectories is important. So pay a little bit of attention to that. And this is what we call ionizing radiation. So I need to speak a little bit about ionization, which is something very, very simple. You get a particle, it goes through matter, and as it goes through matter, it kicks out a few of the electrons that are circling the, the nuclear. And when that happens, you've got ionization. You know, normally, what would, if nothing else was, was present, what would typically happen is the electrons will go back, because, of course, there's a positive charge left at the, at the nucleus. But under certain conditions, like when we make our detectors, we can use this ionization in order to detect things. This is why, but this is also the process that can damage DNA. 
And this is why we talk about radiation and ionizing radiation. This is when the radiation has enough energy to actually force electrons out of their normal orbits. Microwaves do not have enough energy to do that. So microwaves are not ionizing radiation. So this only happens with alpha, beta, and gamma, or x-rays. X-rays are the same. UV is at the very limit. UV is at the limit where it can actually do this sometimes and, and damage the DNA. So this is what ionization is. I'll probably be talking about ionization quite a lot. And the first discoveries happened uh, with cosmic rays. People were trying to figure out uh, how much ionization there was in the atmosphere, and they realized that by flying experiments in balloons, that the higher, you up, higher up you go, the more ionization you get. Now, you get ionization from ionizing radiation, so there must have been some sort of radiation that was coming from the outside rather than from the Earth itself. And while doing experiments, they discovered the muon. This is, this is how the very early discoveries were happening. So what you've got here is some sort of imaging where you can image ionization. You, you can have things like film or you can have other, um, other things where when the charged particle goes through, we leave behind traces. So what you see here is an electron. And the paper says that we discovered a new particle, which is this one, that it's much more heavily ionizing than the electron. And we can see that because the line is it's a lot darker. It means it kicks out a lot more electrons out of their trajectories. That means it has a different mass. And it curves the other way, which means in this particular case, that muon was a positive muon. It, uh, it was not a negative one. So that was one of the first completely new particles to be discovered. And while doing experiments with cosmic rays, they also discovered the pion. A pion has come in through here, there's been an interaction, a muon has been projected. This all comes from um, emulsion. Emulsion is something like film, but in three dimensions, if you like, something that has, actually has a thickness as well. So when particles go through, again, through the ionization process, they leave tracks. And then you can slice it nicely and make pictures of it. In the very early days, we were just trying to make pictures of everything to try and understand what was going on. And we had really lovely tracks like these. So people discovered the muon, new particle. What is all this about? No idea. After a while, while trying to understand a little bit more, we discovered the pion, another particle, behaving differently. No idea. And then, this is a little bit different. This is, this is the neutrino, which was discovered in a completely different way without ever being seen. Uh, and I think the story behind it is, is interesting, so it's worth mentioning. When we get alpha radiation, what happens is we go to the nucleus and it emits an alpha particle. Um, in this particular case, what happens is you, you start with a nucleus, which has a certain mass. And then once the alpha particle, that is two neutrons and two protons, is emitted, you end up with a different nucleus that has four less particles inside. And that new nucleus actually has less mass than the original one. That means that the mass that is left over, less mass than the original one plus the alpha particle. And the, the mass that is missing becomes the energy of the alpha particle. So we're converting mass into energy. We're doing exactly the same thing that the nuclear reactor does in a slightly different way. There you don't emit alpha particles, you emit neutrons, you've got a uranium that breaks up into two different fragments and emits some more neutrons and you get the chain reaction and everything else. But every time that this happens, every time that an alpha particle gets emitted, we must conserve momentum and we must conserve energy. So we've got two quantities that we need to conserve, but only one variable that we can play with, which is the energy of the alpha particle. And that means that we've got two equations that we solve to solve at the same time, and we end up with one solution. And that means that every time a particle is emitted from a nucleus, it has always the same energy. So this is a spectrum, i.e. this is the number of particles emitted and the energy that they have. And we can see that for a particular nucleus, polonium-209, all the alpha particles have exactly the same energy. And if we go to americium-241, different energy, but all the alpha particles have the same energy. And this is something that we can use to, dis to find out, actually, when, when one, one way we can find out what radioactive elements one has, you put it into a gamma spectrometer, 
and, and you can get these, these lines and will tell you what sort of elements you got. Then, when people looked at beta radiation, which is an electron, they saw something different. So what they saw was that the electrons that were coming out did not have always the same energy. They had a spectrum of energy. Some of them had very low energy, most of them were somewhere in the middle, some of them were going all the way to a little bit higher energy. And that was a big problem, because for this to happen, you must not conserve energy. And energy conservation is a, you know, is a basic, basic physics law. So people were scratching their heads, they just couldn't figure it out at all. And then uh, a, physicist, a physicist named Pauli had this idea. He actually sent a letter to a conference. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't actually go to the conference, but he had this idea, wanted to communicate it. So he sent the letter, it's in German, he was German. It starts with the famous dear radioactive ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> And he says, I have hit upon a desperate remedy, desperate remedy, to save the law of conservation of energy. And the idea is that there is another particle. There's another particle that we haven't detected, and it also gets emitted at the same time. And now the energy can be shared between the electron and this other particle that we have no idea about. He calls it a neutron. It is not the neutron that we know of. It is something that's going to be called the neutrino later on. And he says, I admit that my reality may seem almost improbable. He didn't want to admit it. So he, couldn't, he didn't dare publish it, but he thought something must be done. And he says, please scrutinize and judge. <clears throat> so what actually happens is this. So you've got the electron coming out, but in reality you've got a neutron inside the nucleus that decays, disintegrates, and it gives rise to a proton, an electron, and an electron antineutrino, in this particular case, this new particle, which is neutral and very, very difficult to detect. And we'll, I'll tell you towards the end why this is true. But it, it, it was an idea, it was, it was proposed back then in the early 30s, and it was not until the 1970s that we actually managed to discover the neutrino. So what we've got here is a, pixel from, a picture from a bubble chamber a neutrino has come in, invisible, you can see nothing, and then it has kicked out a proton, which has gone a little bit of the way. A new meson has appeared out of nowhere because of the nuclear interaction, and then we also have a pi meson that appears here. So this is probably the first picture of a neutrino actually taken, and we put its discovery. So this is a little bit of what was going on. We're talking about understanding the laws of physics, we're talking about doing experiments up in the atmosphere with cosmic rays, and eventually people started building accelerators. And these are some of the first accelerators that were built. You can see, you can, you can make one that, uh, that can fit onto your table, on your kitchen if you want. And, and then things getting a little bit bigger, uh, very early days on, but this was the, you know, people were trying to create in the laboratory the sort of conditions that were happening in the atmosphere with the cosmic rays, but in a controlled manner. So, why is it that we're using these accelerators? What we're actually doing is we're converting energy to matter. Uh, this is the most famous equation in physics, I hope, and I'm sure that everybody is familiar with it. What does it actually tell us? It tells us that energy on one side and matter on the other side are equivalent things. Not the same thing, but equivalent things. And we can transform from one to the other. It's a bit like saying we've got currencies. We've got two different currencies. They're both money. They're both the same thing. And there is an exchange rate that will allow us to convert you know, pounds into dollars. In this particular case, the exchange rate is the speed of the light square. And that is a big number, right? <laughs> The speed of light is 300,000 km, 300, kilometers per second, uh, per hour, or that's in, in miles per hour, if you prefer. But the point is that if you put it in meters per second, this is a number 10 to the 8. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with powers. It really helps. You can do big numbers very easily when you go like this. Something 10 to the something means a number and a number of zeros afterwards, right? So it's 3 and eight zeros afterwards. And when you square it, you get 16 zeros afterwards. So that suddenly becomes a very, very big number. And what that big number tells us is that 
matter is really very, very highly concentrated energy in some ways. Particles can change direction just a little bit. Now, the, um, the magnetic forces that we need to provide to these things are enormous. And the only way to create very, very strong magnetic fields is to have very high electric currents. And we need to use a special property of materials in order to achieve this. So just to give you an idea, I don't know if all of you remember again your electricity, right? You've got your mains, which is at 240 volts, right? But the amps are regulated by the fuses. So on your circuit, for the fuses are, uh, you typically, I mean, your typical plug has a 13 amp fuse, right? And maybe the main fuse at home is going to be a 30 amp fuse, possibly a 40 amp fuse if you've got, uh, you know, a, a large house. The current in these magnets is 12 and a half thousand amps, right? So it says that the wiring in your house could not potentially take more than 40 amps, and we need to build equipment that can take 12 and a half thousand amps. That is a very, very big challenge. It is not at all straightforward. So we use a special property of certain materials that is called superconductivity. Superconductivity is a property that says that if you cool a material down, a, a wire, let's say, right, made out of metal, it loses all electrical resistance. So the amount of heat produced on a wire, again, touching on the basic knowledge of electricity, is the resistance of the wire times the current squared. And if the resistance is zero, typical mathematics says whatever you go times zero equals zero. And this is a case where this is not a very low number. This is, uh, this is the key situation where quantum mechanics becomes evident in the macrocosmic sort of world in, in normal life because this is completely zero. It's the same as mathematical zero. So you can have 12 and a half thousand amps running in these magnets, creating absolutely no, no heat at all. But that means we have to cool it down, and this is the tricky bit. The operation temperature is minus 271 degrees. Uh, or, to put it another way, it's 1.9 Kelvin, 1.9 degrees above absolute zero. Now, I don't know whether you realize how cold that is. Um, I'll just give you a comparison. Space itself, you know, if you go out in orbit, somewhere between, let's say, Jupiter and Saturn, empty space has a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin because of the cosmic microwave background. So uh, everybody's seen the movies, right? Space is really, really cold. It's completely cold. Well, we actually have to run at a, at a colder temperature than space, uh, empty space itself in order to get these things to work. So these are, this is the LHC sort of in figures. It's almost 27 kilometers. It operates at 1.9 Kelvin. It has two, oh, 1,200 of these magnets in order to fill up the 27 kilometers. Um, each one of them weighs about 35 tons. Uh, and who knows how many hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of thousands of kilometers of cable. And, uh, and the nominal energy is, is 6.5 uh, dB. And using it, we can get up to 1 billion proton proton collisions per second, which we have to find ways to go through, quickly analyze, and decide which ones to keep and which ones to throw away. Right, and then, of course, we need experiments in order to do this. The, the accelerator will accelerate the protons, we make them collide, but at the point of the collision, we need to build experiments that can tell us what is the new things that are going to happen, right? And this is one of the experiments, it's called Atlas. They're all made in a very similar fashion, they're a bit like onions. They've got layers and layers of different equipment, different types of detectors. And this is as we're trying to extract as much information as we can about what has happened in there. And, and, and you can see a average person sort of here, right? And this is the size of the experiment. So it's about 20 meters high, about 40 meters long. It's like a tower block on its side. And then we've got CMS, which is the compact immune solenoid, which is a little bit 
smaller. You can see that the average person looks just a little bit bigger there. They've got a slightly different philosophy. Atlas is big, but not particularly heavy. It weighs only 7,000 tons. CMS is a bit smaller, but more compact, as the name suggests. It weighs 16,000 tons. Both of them have superconducting magnets. They also have these, you know, all of these things. And the collisions happen really at the center of, of the heart of these experiments, and then particles just fly out. And what we're trying to do is detect them and try and understand them. Um, and of course, the best experiment of all is the LHCB experiment, which is my experiment. <laughs> it looks very different, uh, and that is because it's a specialized experiment. It's not a generic thing. So here, the collisions do not happen in the middle. They happen over here. Particles fly everywhere, but the particles we're interested in just fly through most of the detector. And then again, we do a similar thing, where we try and understand what is going on. So we create up to a billion collisions per second of protons. And we sift through them, trying to find a few that may be interesting. Why do we need to make so many? Because when you collide to protons, you never know what is going to happen. And there are probabilities. Certain things happen more frequently than other things. And guess what? The things that happen more frequently, we already know about. Because we discovered them at the previous accelerators. So we need to look for things that happen more rarely like the Higgs boson, which we'll mention a little bit later. Now, a Higgs boson may be produced at every 100 billion collisions. And then one starts to understand why we need to create so many. So what actually happens? We've got these various layers. This is, again, CMS. And what we've done is, right, this is what CMS looks like. And we've taken a slice, sort of from the middle, going up towards the, the side. And we assume that a collision has happened and certain particles have come out. And now you can see, depending on the type of particle, we can use different systems, different detectors, to try and understand what is going on. So um, a muon is a very important particle because it lives long enough to traverse the whole of the, of the detector, and it's this one. It's also very penetrative. Uh, muons can go through material generally easily. Um, Maybe I should make a little, uh, uh, a little interlude here. I don't know if you realize why particles go through matter. The reason particles go through matter is because matter is, in effect, vacuum. That, that is a bit of a surprise to people, because we don't fall through the floor. And if the floor was vacuum, maybe we should have. What is going on is that you've got atoms that are spaced nicely, you know, everywhere, but they are very, very far apart. If you think of an atom, it's like having a football field with the football itself being in the middle. And the football is the nucleus, and the football field is where the electrons go around. And the whole football field is, is empty. And then you get another football field and you put it next to it. So there is really no actual material as such in matter. But what you've got, you've got forces. So it's like having a net. And if you've got two nets, they cannot go through each other, no matter what you do, although they've got very little material. But if you've got something that's smaller between the spaces of the net, it can go through quite easily. You know, a football cannot go through a gold net, but a golf ball will go through the gaps very easily. And this is what happens with particles. They can go through the gaps very, very easily, and as they go, they kick out some electrons, and this is what allows us to detect them. So a muon will come all the way to the outside, uh, while, let's say, an electron will actually not make it all the way to the outside and will stop somewhere here, like this one. Um, a proton will probably stop at this layer, like this one, while a neutron can come out here as well. And over here we've got a lot of magnetic field as well, and this is what forces um, these particles to bend. And by having magnetic field, we can measure the bending radius of the particles, and then we can measure the momentum. Come back to the beginning. So we use magnetic fields in order to steer the beam. And this is when we know the energy of the particles, and we know how much, uh, exactly how much steering we need to do. In this case, we know the magnetic field. And then by measuring how much bending there is, we can measure the momentum. That's the idea. So we can do this and then try and find, understand by looking at all of these particles what actually happened there in the, in the middle. 
So uh, this is an example again from, from LHCB. It's an example of uh, an actual detector because uh, one of our detectors was very, very close to the proton beam and we were afraid it might die. So we built a spare. So what you've got here is you've got this material that you see here. Uh, it's about that size, just to give you an idea. And uh, this is made out of the same material that you build um, electronics, silicon. And then these are the readout electronics out here. So in here, when a particle goes through, it will create a little signal, electrical signal, which we can then amplify with the electronics that we have. And then we've got some support structures that will come out here. We'll send it on into computers where they start to crunch up all the data and try and understand what is, what is going on. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to know did particles actually pass through here, right? And again, this is done this through ionization, and we get these little tick marks, if you like. So you get all of these tick marks everywhere, and then what we try and do is join the dots. It's not easy, uh, because you've got a lot of particles, you can see what mess there is, but you've got dots here, you've got dots here, and you've got some dots here, which are too small to actually see. So we have to use different detectors that give us different resolutions, you know, things for closer together, we need to be able to look at with high accuracy. When you're further out, we don't need quite the same um, accuracy. And then one can, can join the dots, and then we know we've made all of these tracks, and we get an idea of what, what actually happened by um, joining them together. And then we've got other, the other detectors, things we call calorimeters, things we call Cherenkov detectors that give us other kinds of information. So we can get a full image of, of, uh, of an event. So here we start to, to see what is going on. So if you still have the tracks, the bending must let, tells us how much momentum there is. These things that come all the way out here are muons. Things that stop here or stop here are electrons or hadrons. We can measure the energy. A bigger bar here means that the particle had more energy. And over here we get some more information about the mass. This is the magnet. And then some more detectors before, before the magnet. And by putting all of this together, we can do what we call a reconstruction, right? In the same way that an um, accident investigator will collect all the evidence, you know, after an accident, we'll put them into a hangar, we'll look at what is going on, and we'll make the verdict, we do exactly the same thing. Now, we've got a big advantage. We know exactly when something is going to happen and exactly where it's going to happen. It's always at the same place over there. But we have to then try and collect as much information as possible in order to understand what did happen. So the two protons collided, but what happened afterwards? What sort of particles were they creating? <coughs> and we kind of do that working backwards, right? We, we saw some of these muons and, and things like that. And so we, we, we start from the outside and we keep going in. So we start with the two muons. We see that they, they come together into a, a point, and then we can say, ah, they come from a J psi, and we've got these kaons, and, and we can say, oh, they came from a particle called phi, and we can combine these two into a particle called epsilon, and we know that that came from a particle called B. Now, it is not very easy to do that, right? And there are always, there are always mistakes, let's say. There are always errors in all of our uh, things, but the reason that we can do this, remember when I said before, that when we've got the emission of an alpha particle, we need to satisfy energy and momentum conservation. The same thing happens here too. So when we find these two muons, when we add together the mass and energy, what we get is the mass of the particle that decayed and gave us these two muons. And this is what allows us to, to do this. Because if we find two muons and they don't do that, then we say, right, they were not correlated. They came from different events or something. And, and by using techniques like this, one, mean, you know, one can be reasonably confident that you know, this is not just imaginary. We, we know all of these things. So of course, in order to know this, it means that somebody in the past discovered this particle called the J psi. And actually, the person that did that got the Nobel Prize. Um, so this is how it all works. We start with the two protons, they collide, things fly out, and then we start reconstructing the event. And in this particular case, what we've done is we've done the reconstruction. More or less everything here is known. So it's all straightforward. But so what we can do is, is we, can, we can look at all of these things. And then what you do is you make 
you make a combination you know, of two muons, right, a mu plus and a mu minus, and then you try and see whether you can discover something. So these are all the particles we already know about. So we take these two muons, if they are not correlated, they will give you just a random number when you add them together. And random number means that it will be distributed somewhere here, but there will not be a preferred value. But if they come from the decay of the particle, when you add them together, you're going to get the mass of the particle. And in this case, the, the value is preferred, is always the same, because the particle has the same mass, it's part of its properties. So whenever the two particles come from Z, they will always add up here. So what usually happens after a while is you're just getting more and more and more. And you do this, and then you can see the various particles. And all of these things are, are things we know, but in reality, in here, at some point, you could get another peak somewhere here, let's say. And then this is where you start saying, ah, this is something I do not know. This is something new. This is something that we just discovered. By the way, the peaks look much cleaner. This, this is a logarithmic plot, if you look at here. One, ten, a hundred, a thousand. This is done like this in order to be able to understand really, really well all the tails and everything else. But the peaks are, are really easy to, to spot and identify. So this is how we discovered the Higgs. Um, this is data that took uh, about two years to collect. You can see the dates. And what is going on is we're doing exactly the same thing. We're actually, we have four muons in this case. And over time, we're getting the data. Now, in red, what you see is what we would expect to get with the physics that we already know. And over here, there is a discrepancy. I'll play it again so that you can follow it up. So this is, this is why it's taking so long, because these events are very, very rare. But over here, you see, there is now a discrepancy between the red curve and the data. The red curve is the theory, is the things that we've already known. And the fact that these things add up means that there's something new, something that we do not understand. And now this also tells you why we need to be running these accelerators for years and years and years. Because what happens is, okay, well, I mean, I don't know. This, this, this line over here tells you how far away you are from the background. And you can see little things pop out here and there as they, the data gets more and more. But we need to be sure that what we're seeing is not what is called a statistical fluctuation, something that is more or less random. So eventually, we have to ask ourselves this question, which is, how likely is it that the theory that we already know can explain the data that we just collected? I, how likely it is that this peak that we just discovered over here in the crosses is just a random event? And, and this is where we're applying the number of sigma, as we say. There's the three sigma and the five sigma. Three sigma is typically one in a thousand. And this is where we start talking about things being interesting. And five sigma is one in a million. So once we've gone to the chances of this happening randomly are below one in a million, then we say that we've done a discovery. So this is how we discovered the Higgs boson. Back in 2012, you may remember it, it was kind of in the news. <coughs> um, it was suggested that the discovery was about as significant as the, the discovery of, uh, of the DNA. But it's something that, that completed something that we call the standard model. So having done all of these things, what it is that we currently know about the universe, if you like, about nature itself? Well, everybody knows this, right? Now, the, the reality is a little bit more complicated. So, the first thing that I need to introduce here is the idea that forces are also particles. So, when we talk about the force in the world of the particles, what we talk is about the exchange of another particle, a particle for a force. How is that supposed to work? Well, imagine that you know, you're in a boat, you're holding a ball, and you throw it to somebody else. What will happen is because you need to conserve momentum, you're going to start moving forward, right? And the other person that just got the ball also needs to 
conserve momentum, and because the ball was going that way, will also move that way. And in this way, it's like having two electrons that just exchange the photon, and so that's it. That's the end. Right, let's make a start. And um, sorry to break up all your conversations. Not really that, sorry. <laughs> right, the, the, the normal rules continue. You can get a drink. Um, we will say that uh, I normally start on one side of the room and we vaguely work across. Put your hand up when you want to ask a question. Um, next month, it will be the third. Um, Wednesday of the month, and I don't know what it is off the top of my head, we have Hassan Ragwan, is he called? Yes, yeah, Hassan. Yeah. Um, and the topic is to be confirmed, but he speaks on some of the themes that Sadia, if you were here a few months ago, speaks on, um, about Islam, and sort of, we're going to be looking at a, maybe a skeptic's... Um, uh, what's the... Dan, you explain what he talks about. <laughs> <laughs> Truth is, uh, the subject matter hasn't been agreed, but I want him to uh, surprise us, because we probably have a lot of preconceptions about Islam, and some are going to be wrong. Preconceptions, that was the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you need a Dan around. Um, yes, just sometimes, not too often, once a month is fine. Uh, <laughs> and don't forget, <laughs> don't forget our social at the Mad Squirrel on the first Wednesday of the month. Join Meetup or our Facebook page and you'll get all those details. Um, questions. Right, as usual, I'm going to start. I have four questions. Um, so either I can, you can answer them all quickly. Yeah, let, okay. First of all, have you met Professor Brian Cox? <laughs> I've seen him. You've seen him? I've seen him at the event, so from a distance. Oh, sorry. Brilliant. The, um, the Large Hadron Collider is obviously round, so you can send things round and round and round and round. Why does it have to be so big? Why can't, you, why can't it be smaller and you just send things round more times? Because if you make it smaller, then the centripetal force that you need is higher. Right? You know, if, if something goes at the same speed, but right. a short circle... So you need more powerful magnets? You need more powerful magnets. And we okay. cannot get more powerful magnets. Okay. This is the limit of the technology that we have. So we'll never, well, at the moment we... So if you want to make a more powerful accelerator, the easiest thing to do is make it bigger. Using the same technology, you make it bigger, you don't need to, you need, you've got a smaller yeah. bending radius, so you can put more power in using the same magnets. Yeah. We are developing new magnets that they can go up to 16,000 amps. These seem to be okay. Going beyond that, there is no obvious answer at the moment. Right. And um, we can't just build a really long straight one? The problem with the straight one, um, one can use straight accelerators for electrons, for different right. reasons. The, the advantage of having a circular one means that you only have to accelerate the, the particles in a small part, mm. right? Because they go round and round yeah. and round. So you can, every time they come around, you can kick them a little bit more. So going at the speed of light, 27 kilometers, they go around 11,000 times per second. Right? So you can accelerate them multiple times, so you do not need the accelerated part to be quite short. But the most important part is, you bring them into collision, and the ones that do not collide continue to go around. Okay. Yeah. Just to give you an idea how the whole thing works, right? The, a cycle of the LHC starts with uh, what we call the injection. So we start putting particles in. The particles are in bunches, the beam is not continuous. You get bunches every seven and a half meters. Every bunch has about 120 billion protons. And then you can fill up the accelerator with up to 144 bunches at a time, and it can take up to 2,500 bunches per beam you know, to fill up the whole thing. Uh, that means it takes about half an hour to fill up. Then it takes half an hour to accelerate. Then you need to do a little bit of gymnastics to the beam in order to eventually bring them into collision for another half an hour. And then you collide for something between 12 and 15 hours at 1 billion collisions per second. And you can do this because, of course, you've got all of these protons inside the accelerator, and the ones that do not collide go around and collide again later on and later on. 
if you got a straight accelerator, you put the beam in, hits, yeah. everything's gone. Great. Okay, my, the two, these two you have to answer really quickly. Uh, the Higgs boson, um, surely that's proof of God, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. And um, we, I mean, <laughs> it, was, it was a journalist that called it the God particle. Of course it was. No particle physicist likes this. <laughs> right? We leave God out of anything. And my final question, is it more important than the discovery of DNA, as you alluded to in the talk? I, I, well, I, I, don't, I don't think so in no. some ways. Right. <laughs> Let's start on this side. So who's got a question? Put up your hand, and then I'll move from this side to that side. Do not be scared if, it, if you think it's stupid, or you think you're wrong, or right, or... Let's start here. Right, so where's all the, where are the large magnets uh, built? Are they built in CERN or subcontracted? CERN, CERN developed the technology, uh, so no company knew how to build these things before. So we developed the technology. Actually, the the cable inside the magnet is called the Rutherford cable because it was it was developed at Rutherford Lab where I work. And and then we went out and we told companies what it is that we wanted to do and could they do it for us because we needed it done in very very large numbers so they were the magnets themselves were built by three companies one german one french and one italian rumor has it the italians don't work as well as the german and the french <laughs> <laughs> but no comment <laughs> The reason the LHC is now running at six and a half TV and not seven is because of something called um, quenching. If you push the magnet too high, they quench. It means they lose superconductivity, and then uh, and then they don't work anymore. You have to power everything down, start everything again. We hope that eventually we manage to train the magnets to to be able to work at seven TV. We'll see. Great, thank you. Hey, it looks like this side is uh, more more questioning. So, we'll start here. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what the particles actually hit. The particles. Yeah, the protons. You're okay. In, in the old days, you would have something called the target. You would accelerate the protons, and then you hit some sort of material, right? Carbon could be one thing, beryllium could be another, whatever you want. To. Nowadays, what we do in a collider is protons hit other protons. You've got two beams, one beam going in one direction, the other beam going in the other direction, and then the, the things meet in the middle and they hit each other. And the advantage in this case, again, because we need to conserve momentum, if you have two beams that are coming into opposite directions, it means that the total momentum beforehand was zero, the momentum afterwards can be zero, so you've got more energy available to make new particles while in what we call a fixed target experiment, where the, proton, the protons move and the target is fixed, you do not have so much energy, because everything has to keep moving, because you need to conserve momentum. It's very difficult to make them hit each other. You have to realize that... Um, so you've got 120 billion protons in something that looks like a human hair in thickness. Right? And the two human hairs cross each other like this. And out of the 120 billion, about 20 protons hit each other. So if you've got a million collisions in a second, I'm guessing the shutter speed isn't a billionth of a second. So I'm assuming that the, um, the detectors record multiple events in any one period. But what is the actual? The shutter speed, how narrow it, how many, how many events so the, the, are there? The shutter speed is 25 nanoseconds, <coughs> which means, okay, in reality, what we've got is we've got 40 million bunch bunch collisions per second, but in a, in a particular bunch collision, you can have up to 25 protons, up to 50 protons actually colliding, and this is what gives you the 1 billion proton proton collisions. But what is the actual shutter speed? I mean, you get two bunches coming together, they collide, something happens. 25 nanoseconds later, two other bunches come and collide. So 25 nanoseconds is the clock of, of the LHC, and it means that this is our working clock, right? We need to be able to tell generally what is going on with an accuracy of a nanosecond 
all below one. And it is true that in an experiment that's 40 meters long, you're going to have three or four collisions inside the detector at the same time, and you can separate them by time because the particles move across at the speed of light. So when you take a snapshot, you, you do it with little delays so that you eventually end up with this information from the same collision. So, but is it, so is it a single event you're seeing, or is it actually multiple events and you're unpicking those so multiple for us, events? One, one event for us, if you like, is a, is, a, is a bunch collision. In that event, you could have up to 25 proton-proton collisions. We don't care. We reconstruct everything. We can see all of the 25 proton-proton collisions, and we can see the one Higgs that was generated in one of them. Okay. So the fact that we've got multiple proton-proton collisions means that we can we can take more data faster. Instead of getting one proton to collide every time the two beams cross, we get 20. So we get 20 times more data. Okay, thank you. But it is true that decisions about what to do have to be made almost at that rate because you go to collision and then you have to decide whether you're going to keep it or not. So we've got something called the pipeline. We, we put things in a memory and then we allow about a microsecond or so to make a decision. Do we keep this or do we throw it away? And we keep the data that's been stored. Yes, so, so the, the data gets written into a memory really, really fast. All the data is there. And then you allow yourself a little bit of time, like a microsecond, which means a million times a second, to say, no, 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 yes, no, 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 yes. And the no happens about 39 million 900,000 times, and the yes happens to the rest, because we only keep about 5,000 out of the 40 million events per second. Is, it, uh, is this like a RAM or a hard disk? Or? No, it, it's, it's not nothing like that. It's, it's pure electronics. It's memory in the electronics themselves. You, you're well before going anywhere to a computer, because the amount of data that you need to transform is enormous. So like static RAM? It's, it's memory that you design the same way that you would design a CCD, which allowed you to store oh, charts right. 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 in a similar fashion. So you can, you can move things or digital logic. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to ask about these sigmas, which is, uh, I think you said five sigma, which is like a million to one. Yeah. Um, I remember that number being talked about when the Higgs boson was confirmed in the news a few years ago. I, I was astounded, really, because um, in normal science, normally two sigmas at 95% confidence limit is, is kind of sufficient. And I think Andrew Wakefield with his 16, um, <laughs> his, his one would have been half a sigma, I don't know what it would have been, it would have been tiny compared to this five sigma. So well, it seems astoundingly unlikely the, the threshold ha that has to be crossed, it's a million to one, yes. before it's confirmed. Yes. I mean, I know Brexit, no deal Brexit is a million to one. Isn't it? <laughs> but but we're, talking, we're talking about physics. And, and physics... <laughs> <laughs> so what, what makes physics different? Physics is exact. That's the difference. There is no, there is no ifs, there is no buts, there is no... You know, a single accurate experiment in physics will destroy the theory completely. It's as simple as that. So, uh, on the other hand, if you, if you allow for one in a thousand, for three sigma, there are a lot of three sigma things that have gone away. Because if you're searching for something, if, you know, there are a thousand possibilities, well, eventually things will happen, completely by accident. So yeah, we, we have a five. Actually, the Higgs, when it was discovered, it was 4.9. It was close enough. When, when the two experiments combined together, I think, each one of them had 4.9, but together they could claim that they were above 5, so the discovery was announced. Do you know of any other science that has this high level of signal? I don't know, but we're, talking about a, we're not talking about things that... Nothing that we have discovered has ever been falsified, right? You have to realise the difference between sort of hints and understanding and then... People tend to confuse, physics is not like, is our carbohydrates good for you or not, right? Or you can change your mind, new evidence can come up and, and that sort of thing. It's, actually this is a point I'd like to make, because frequently I get people asking me, aren't you afraid that something bad is going to happen? 
And if you do not know what you're going to find, that means that everything is possible. But that is not true. Right? We do not know what we're going to find, but whatever it is we're going to find has to be compatible with what we already know. And this is why we've got this really high thing. So Einstein's theory of relativity was new compared to Newtonian gravity, but it contains Newtonian gravity. It never said that Newtonian gravity is wrong, because it was experimental science. So the data is still valid. It, it's a different way of doing things, I guess. Great. Because Ed mentioned Andrew Wakefield and Brexit in one question, he's <laughs> never allowed the microphone again. <laughs> right. Uh, Andre. You mentioned at one point that uh, it might be the biggest discovery since the DNA. Uh, how would you explain to, a, let's say, more ignorant people, what are the applications in the real world and why is, it, why is this important to the world? Um, I'll, 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 I'll say two things. Um, the first thing is that we currently do not know. Right? When electricity was discovered, people were asking, what is it good for? Uh, now, how can I imagine being found electricity? When quantum mechanics was discovered, no one would ever think that this is what would eventually lead, lead to mobile phones. Right? It's the fact that we understand matter so well that allows us to make a billion transistors or a hundred billion transistors designed a tiny amount of space to make a processor for a mobile phone. Having said, so it, the answer is we do not know yet. But having said that, it is obvious that all of the experiments that were happening in the past, one could do in the lab, on a tabletop, right, in some way or another. So one could think of applications that could come eventually. Now, the discovery of the Higgs boson today does not really tell you what the applications are going to be, because you need a huge machine, right, to run for, you know, three years to make a thousand of them. The thing, though, is that now we understand the theory. So if we're ever going to find something new, and when I'm talking about new, you have to open your imagination, you know, you have to think Star Trek, you have to think Star Wars, right? If we don't know the theory, there will never be an application. So it may take a thousand years. It may take more, assuming that humanity will survive, right? But if we don't do the research, it will never happen. So this is... Now, it is, it is tricky. You cannot say, is this worth more than doing research on the brain and understanding consciousness? I don't know. Maybe not. Somebody else has to make this decision. The point is you cannot stop it. You cannot stop it completely, because otherwise you will never get to do what they do in Star Trek. <laughs> it's a very good answer. <laughs> right, well, uh, Dan. Oh, is that the last one? No, so on this side of the room. We have one question on this side, yeah? There might be some time. We're actually not here. You, you, you did a, a Feynman diagram on there, and hence you talked about the force carrier particles, the bosons. Please, could you just enlighten me as to how the hell, what, the, what they really are, how, the, how they got to that. I just, that, that's, that's like one of the things that Cox would sort of explain. I know there's maths behind it, but can you enlighten me a little bit more about what the force carrier particles are? They are, they, are, they are particles, they are virtual particles. Have the theorists come up with... This sort of thing? Yeah. It came out of the quantization of energy, really. So it, it came up with... Um, okay, you have to go back into... Uh, I don't know if anybody has heard of something called the black body radiation. Uh, it, the, the idea is, I mean, the sun would be a black body, although it's not black at all. The idea is that you get no reflection. So imagine, imagine that you've got a box that has a tiny little hole, and then you look at what comes out of this hole. So what comes out of there is never reflected from, from anything. It's from what's happening inside. And it, it's really a, a function of temperature. So something that is cold, you cannot really see it. Something that's a little bit warmer, like an electric heater, glows red. Most of the radiation comes out of the infrared. 
If you warm it up a bit more, more light comes out, original things, the sun. Anyway, there is a distribution of energies that, that depends on the temperature. And people were trying to explain why you get this distribution, and they couldn't come up with any particular way of explaining this. And somebody, I can't remember who it was, or something, had the idea that if you force energy not to be able to take any value but quantize it, then you end up in a situation like this. And then you do things like the photoelectric, pardon? That was Planck, thank you. Uh, and, then, and then you do things like the photoelectric effect, where you've got an electron that's going around an atom, a photon comes in, it absorbs, the electron can absorb it, it moves up, then it comes down again, emits the photon again. So it's all about the quantization of energy and the photons. And this is what gave rise to quantum um, uh, electrodynamics, quantum physics, and, and the idea of the photons as the carriers of the force, and things like that. So a photon is a carrier of a force as well? Yes, a photon is so a carrier of a force. A photon is a boson? A photon is a boson, has, ah, yes. Oh, okay. Right. A spin one. Right. You can tell that, but oh. if you revolve the, the diagram 90 degrees, you make them, and then they decay. It's the same diagram. So this is, this is how it all, it all started, and then people had you know, this idea of quantization also allowed electrons to have orbits around uh, the nucleus, right? Because singular radiation will make electrons lose energy and eventually collapse. So if something had to be there in order to stop electrons from, from hitting the, the nucleus of the atom, and the idea was that the photons could do whatever, so the electrons could move in between steps only. I don't understand, I mean, that's the A level of physics and chemistry. I don't get why the quantization stuff gets you to this um, force carrier boson business. Of, I don't because if you now, if you if you think of yourself, you're in an atom, right? And then a photon comes in, the electron can absorb it and do something. That's energy on levels. But it's yeah, but how does it move, right? You need you need the electron. The electron has changed its orbit. So a force so was applied. So in changing the orbit, that's where this photon comes. A photon comes in, the electron absorbs it, and does something. Right. That's the same as a force. Right. Yeah. Okay, let, let's move on from that question. We, <laughs> we can discuss it after if we need to be. <laughs> there's, a, there's a brilliant book by Feynman called Quantum Electrodynamics. <laughs> Where he describes a lot of things from the early days when he did things, and it yeah. gives you some idea of quantum mechanics. It's a, it's a very well written book. Is that, pop, is that, is that a popular science? Or no, it's popular science. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 not a, it's not a textbook. I think I sort of half remember from somewhere that um, when Paul Dirac uh, posited the uh, positron, uh, it was by the idea that an electron going forward in time is equivalent to a positron going backwards in time. So I just wonder if that's where all the antimatter might be, because uh, it seems to be vaguely reminiscent of Neil Chirac's idea of um, some sort of disproportionation at the, uh, the Big Bang. So there's our universe going forward in time. There's another one going backwards in time. Is that where all the antimatter is? <laughs> um, that's an interesting uh, concept. It is true that, that when, I mean, it didn't it come immediately from the but it comes out of time diagrams where a antiparticle appears as a particle going backwards in time when you put the others. That is true. Um, but I, I don't think that it, what does it mean to start at time zero and go backwards? Uh, then it's a forward direction in that direction, no? So we are might be the ones going backwards. <laughs> um, and, and then once you take that into account, I guess the theory should have come up with a, with a theory that could possibly explain it. And I guess the fact that no one has done this yet makes that it's very difficult to get it to work. But uh, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, so there's um, only one 
LHC. So there's a question of reproducibility of this ex experiment. Um, and you do, you do. I know there were two teams, and they were like there were strict protocols as to what data that they were allowed to share, methods, and so on. So how, can you argue as to those protocols whether that satisfies the argument of, of uh, reproducing the experiment? So there's one LHC, but there are two experiments that are completely different. There's Atlas and CMS. And uh, the, the philosophy behind the experiments is, is generally different. So Atlas has a central magnet and toroid magnet, uh, and it's sort of much bigger. CMS has only the solenoid, and it's a lot more compact. So you know th these things are they do not exchange data. And, and there's usually more than one team working on the same data using possibly different methodology. So to have two different experiments come up with exactly the same results cannot be accidental. So plus what we do nowadays is not to avoid bias as much as possible, is we do something called blind analysis, where we do the whole of the analysis of data without looking at exactly where we expect something to be. Now, for the Higgs, I don't know whether that was possible because they didn't know where to look in the first place. But in other situations, we do a lot of that in order to avoid, uh, in order to avoid bias. Three sigma effects can appear because we decide to put a, a selection of data in a particular way um, when, when you're analyzing the data. It, it's a little bit tricky sometimes. If, you, if theory says you would expect to get 10 events, right, and you get five, then how exactly you select the five? Is, is very, very important because if you change a tiny number somewhere, you could easily get to eight, and then you are within what theory would, uh, would predict. So the, I, think, I think mathematicians and particle physicists are the only ones that actually understand statistics properly. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, sparking talk, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nope. Is it possible that the two teams met up in a pub in Zurich um, over a, I can't even think of a Swiss beer, and, um, and Erdinger, no, that's Bavarian, and, and um, shared a bit of data secretly. No, not possible. No. Um, but what does it mean to share a bit of data, right? I mean, the best thing you can do is say, oh, you know, we've seen something at that energy. Have you seen anything? And the other team might say, yes, maybe. Yes, we have. Uh, but, then, but then that's not enough, right? Actually, just at some point, uh, just before the LHC closed for what we call the long shutdown one, there was this seminar that was given by, by both experiments at the same time about a 2.7 sigma effect at 750 GV. So apparently both teams had seen something, a 2.7 sigma effect, so not quite three, way far away from five, about a new particle at an energy of 750 GeV, which is something that none of the theories expected, and, and it became really, really exciting. Um, and then we had to wait two years, and then the LHC started working again, and then nothing happened. The, the new data came in, and there was no particle there. So no, it's not it's not enough. Even even if they do talk to each other, it wouldn't be enough. Um, you saw sort of mentioned earlier that most of the data is being junked. Yes. Um, how, how how is that decision being made? How how is it deciding what to keep and what not to? Is there any selection bias here? Are you picking out the oh that's interesting, or oh, that's interesting? Is there any bias being built in there, or is it? Um, yes and no. The, the, the answer is, first of all, we are looking for things that we would hope to find, if you like, or expect to find, or fit within certain models most of the time. That is true. So we're throwing away a lot of things like that. At the same time, what we also do is we keep some of the data in a random fashion. That's very little, not enough to discover new physics, but then you can compare the small amount of data that we just collect randomly with the rest of the data that we keep, just to understand whether we're building any, any biases into our selections. But it is true that it is a, a bit of an issue. If there was a different kind of physics, uh, we may be missing it. But if there was a different kind of physics, it might be almost impossible to trigger on it. That's part of the problem. So we, you may simply need to make a different type of experiment. 
this type of experiment has certain limitations. Um, and, and so if it would be, because you cannot, if you make billions and billions and billions of collisions, you have to be able to select the ones that will be interesting. Otherwise, everything will be completely buried. Right, we have time, I think, for one or two more questions, if we have any. It's, oh, you're making me, oh, we'll start here, perfect. Uh, you spoke about the quantization of energy. Um, what happens if time-space is quantized as well? Well, that is the problem with gravity in many ways, right? Um, the, the theory of time and space is the general relativity. General relativity says space is curved, curves because of mass, and then you get the effects of gravity. All of that in classical mechanics, in, as a classical theory, no quantization. Now, gravity is a really, really strange theory in the way it behaves. I mean, it's the oldest one that we know of. However, if you try to quantize it, it becomes difficult. No one has actually managed to do that yet. So if, I mean, one assumes that, that quantizing space and time would make life a little bit easier, but no one knows how to do it. Carlo Rovelli. It's not, it's not solvable yet, right? I mean, there are many ideas on, on how this could potentially happen, but there is no, there is no theory as such yet. Presumably, all the existing equations assume that um, space and time are continuous. Um, sort of, yes. Uh, in, in what sense? Um, general relativity does assume that space time no, is. Now, the standard model, what we do is, this is, for me personally, that is a little bit of a problem with uh, the standard model, which is, you've got the theories that are on top of space and time, while relativity is a theory of space and time. So in that sense, to me, it seems that relativity is a more fundamental theory than the standard model, because it's not built on top of space and time, it is based on space and time itself, it explains space and time. So ideally, you would like a quant quantum field theory that could do something similar, which we do not have. Now, there is something called the Planck scale, uh, 10 to the minus 33, I don't know if it's centimeters or meters, at that level it doesn't make any difference. Um, <laughs> and and it, it says that at that level, space is, is quantized. But it's so small, it's so far beyond anything one could potentially do that as soon as you go just a little bit further away, it just goes continuous anyway. So it could, it, it really depends on what is the, the, the spacing, if you like, of the quantization, right? Whether it's going to affect anything that, that we're doing or not. And then more dimensions come into this and, and, and other things like that. You could potentially have more space dimensions as long as they're small enough. It is, yes, it could be a small effect that we haven't noticed yet, and eventually, yeah, I mean, uh, extra space dimensions is something that we're looking for. Well, when we're looking for other things, apart from finding things that, that we find them by discovering them, right, we're also looking at things that we're missing. We know exactly how much energy we're putting into a proton proton collision, so we're looking for that amount of energy to come out in the form of particles. And we're const constantly looking for things that could be potentially missing, things that could be dark matter, things that could be gravitons, things that could be other dimensions that particles go into. And so far, we have not seen anything significant. Right, our final question over here, I think. Um, a fairly basic one, right? <laughs> Are current jet and LHC related? Pardon? Are current jet and the LHC related to jet to Ah, no, no, not at all. One is doing fusion, the other one is doing... <coughs> the, 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 some of the physics behind it might be similar, but not really. But one other fundamental, what sort of uh, energy demand does the LHC um, quite significant. Uh, most of the energy goes into trying to keep the magnets cool. Yeah. Uh, the advantage of having superconducting magnets is that they do not consume any energy yeah. because they have no resistance. Um, 
The whole of CERN typically runs at about 150 megawatts. Uh, like about the same as the town of Geneva. Uh, I would say about half of it goes towards the LHC. And most of the energy comes from France. <laughs> Where they've got plenty of spare nuclear power, yes. We'll be buying in a few months' <laughs> time. Right. I, obviously, Angela, to be around if you've got any more questions. I assume you don't mind. For a few. Yeah. You know, trying to avoid Dan, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but thank you so much. Let's give another massive round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Certainly, when I was asked to talk and speak in the break, they were really impressed by everything and so many people said oh, I'd really like to get more into this so where would people start like are there books podcasts uh, things on Netflix people can watch or DVDs people can rent on where does one, where does I, one start uh, I don't know I guess you, know, you go to Google and type your question fair uh, enough and see what comes up <laughs> see where it takes you there are definitely loads of videos on YouTube. Stay away from the flat air plants, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've done that this year already, haven't we? So <laughs> that's great. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll be here in um, about a month's time um, for Hassan. I forgot his name, Ronnie Hadwin. Um, uh, we'll first Wednesday of the month for the social. Um, hang around a bit. The bar is vaguely still open. I know they're clearing up, but if you do want to hang around for a little bit, that's fine. And we will see you all soon.